So, um, good afternoon, good evening, sir. Um, Dr. Dave Bradison, I'm very glad uh, to have you um, on this um, call, on this conference call um, for vitalstoffblog.de um, in Germany. Readers and audience of my blog know that um, on this site they will um, get information on holistic health and integrative health care and uh, I'm very happy to be talking about a fascinating book uh, of yours. Um, the End of Alzheimer's is the title and it's going to come forward in Germany in May but uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate uh, to be uh, able to talk to, about the whole issue with you um, ahead of uh, this release in, uh, in, in the spring. So very, very warm welcome to you, Dr. Dave Bredesen. Thanks very much, Uwe. Thanks for talking with me. Um, maybe, uh, Dr. Bredesen, uh, it is uh, interesting to learn for our audience um, how you came to write this kind of um, book. Uh, you have been involved in neural um, um, medicine um, and neuroscience for the whole of your career, I understand. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yes, I came from a very typical uh, basic science background, uh, worked at uh, Caltech and MIT, uh, and uh, then went into neurology, uh, and so studied medicine, and I was interested in the fundamentals of brain disease and my laboratories published over 220 papers, uh, and all about neurodegeneration. So the whole question that we tried to look at over the last 30 years was, could we understand the phenomenon of neurodegeneration, be it for Alzheimer's or ALS or Huntington's or what have you, at a fundamental enough level that we could fashion the first effective treatments for these illnesses. Because as you know, this is arguably the area of greatest biomedical failure. There, there have been treatments for cancer that are fairly successful, treatments for heart disease, but there really hasn't been anything for neurodegenerative diseases. And so we wanted to know why is that? Why are these things so common? In fact, Alzheimer's is now the third leading cause of death in the United States. And in fact, dementia is the number one cause of death now in the United Kingdom. So these are huge and growing global trillion dollar problem. And the question is, what have we missed? Why have we been missing out on treatment? As you probably know, um, in one decade, there were 244 clinical trials for Alzheimer's. 243 failed outright. And the su success um, had a very, very modest effect. And so this, the work has, has really culminated in the last several years with back, getting back to the first patients after many years with cells and many years with, with transgenic mice and fruit flies and things like this. It's really culminated in seeing the first improvements in people with Alzheimer's. And we published the first paper on this actually in 2014, the first examples of reversal of cognitive decline. And it's really shown us a completely new kind of medicine, which I understand uh, you are very interested in as well. What yes. it's really shown us is the way we go after this is wrong. We've been trying to treat this disease without understanding it. Yes, and um, um, you're absolutely right. I am fascinated um, by this kind of medicine in general, but I'm particularly fascinated by what I read um, in your book, um, The End of Alzheimer's. And... What I learned, um, if I get, if I got it wrong, uh, sorry, if I got it right, is that Alzheimer's is not so much an illness but a response. Um, our um, body, our our system, um, uh, has evolved uh, for for certain insults. Could you please explain what Alzheimer's really is in this um, uh, understanding of yours? Exactly. So as you know, um, we try to look at these very complex organisms, human beings, and their illnesses with tiny, tiny data sets. And I call this the complexity gap, because when you have a computer you know, fly your plane, you match the complexity of the task with the complexity of the program. But when you go out to see a patient, 
you look at things like serum sodium, serum potassium, and then you tell the person, oh, you have this thing we call Alzheimer's. We don't understand it. We don't look at it very deeply. We don't look at a lot of data. And then we give you a drug that doesn't work and you die. It's a horrible, horrible situation. So now when you expand the data sets and you now start looking at much, many, many more data points, what you find is something really remarkable. You find that this thing, this, this disease we refer to as Alzheimer's disease, is actually, just as you said, a protective response to several different types of insults. And not surprisingly, you have subtypes of the disease that hadn't been appreciated before based on what you are actually responding to. So if you're going to treat it successfully or prevent it successfully, then what you need to do is look at all of the different contributors. And we initially identified 36. We now know that there are a few more, but there aren't thousands. There are dozens, the bottom line is. And these explain the epidemiology, for example, and the genetics and the biochemistry of this illness. So, if, for example, if you have chronic inflammation, as an example, and you can get that because you have a leaky gut or because you're eating the wrong kinds of food with trans fats and things or because you have chronic exposure to fungi or chronic exposure to spirochetes or oral bacteria or chronic viral infections then part of your response to these chronic this chronic inflammation is to make amyloid amyloid is an antimicrobial as shown by Dr. Robert Moyer and and Dr. Rudy Tanzi at Harvard. So it is a response. And I think about it very much like napalm. So if you're, if someone, if you're a country and someone breaches your borders, now you want to kill the invaders. But in so doing, you scorch the earth. You now have less arable soil. So what you've done is you've pulled back and said, I am to survive, I'm going to put down something that separates me from the invaders and hopefully kills the invaders. But in so doing, I'm going to have to now have a smaller area. And that's exactly what happens in the Alzheimer's brain. You put down something that downsizes the neural network. Now, interestingly, your brain uses a similar response when you have the essentially the converse problem where what happens is you, d you don't have enough nutrient, you don't have enough support nerve growth factor, BDNF, estradiol, testosterone, vitamin D, and so forth and so on. Again, you don't have enough to feed the masses. So what do you do? You downsize. And how do you downsize? You put out the amyloid again. You downsize the network. And so you are now, again, adjusting to what you can act to, uh, to a mismatch, basically. And so we call that type 2 Alzheimer's. The inflammatory one is type 1. The A, what we call atrophic, is type 2. And then type 3 is where you have a chronic exposure to specific And these can be divalent metals like mercury or copper or iron, which, by the way, amyloid binds very tightly to those. So, it, again, you're putting it out as a protection and it could also be biotoxins. And this is very common. We see people who are exposed to mycotoxins from specific molds like Stachybotrys or Penicillium or Aspergillus. And so you're now putting this out to bind these. In each case, the result is what we call Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. But the inducers vary dramatically. And so you need to identify all contributors and then address those. Right. Um... Mm -hmm. What I also learned in, in this um, respect is that the brain, and you, you, you provide examples and, and stories, uh, personal um, stories of, of patients um, in your book, the brain is responding um, uh, uh, to, to insults, but the brain in itself is something which is an organ which has been able to, um, to, to provide a, a balance of, uh, of supporting and destructing um, uh, activity um, right. generally as, as, as an organ. So regrowing um, 
um, synapses um, is not only possible, but is um, is it really just the usual thing which the brain, as many organs do, as you, you also talk about uh, osteo um, blastic and osteoclastic activity and uh, synaptoblastic and synaptoclastic. So maybe you can explain what, how do you, how how do we understand what what goes on in a in a healthy brain and what goes on uh, in a brain which is uh, not so healthy anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. So if you look at the work, for example, of Professor Mike Mersnick, who won the Connolly Prize this past year for his work on neuroplasticity, um, as he points out, the brain is constantly engaging in its in an, an uh, optimization of its own neuroplasticity based on feedback. So what we found is that uh, APP, amyloid precursor protein, that is a central player in Alzheimer's disease, literally is like a molecular switch. So you can cleave it at three sites and produce four peptides that are all involved in physiologically pulling back in synapse loss, synapse reorganization, that is the synaptoclastic side. On the other hand, the same parent molecule, APP, can also be cleaved at a single site, the alpha site, to produce two peptides, SAPP-alpha and alpha-CTF, that actually support neurite growth, synaptic maintenance. So these are, by definition, synaptoblastic. So when you are young, you have a nice balance between the synaptoblastic activity and the synaptoclastic activity. You know, you're actively forgetting the seventh song you played on the radio on the way to work yesterday. You're actively remembering the most important things, like where your keys are and what you're going to do later in the day, things like that. So when people have cognitive decline or risk for cognitive decline, this balance is out of whack so that the synaptoclastic activity chronically exceeds the synaptoblastic. And you can measure that. You measure it by seeing that you have the amyloid beta and you have the, the uh, CTF beta and you have the SAPP beta. You have those very fragments that are associated with pulling back. So you have this beautiful dynamic uh, interaction here. And so what happens, you get out of whack here. And so when we treat patients, whether it's for prevention or reversal, of course what we want to do is decrease the synaptoclastic activity and increase the synaptoblastic activity. And we can look at dozens and dozens, as I mentioned, of contributors. So, uh, for example, if you have a high HSCRP related to chronic inflammation, you are going to be on the wrong side of that balance. If you have a very low vitamin D, you're going to be on the wrong side of that balance, and so on and so on. We look currently at 150 different parameters, which again is part of precision medicine. This is the medicine of the future, looking at the appropriate drivers of the process instead of trying to treat it blindly. Um, I'm glad you, you, you um, um, come back to this issue which you have addressed basically uh, a few months before uh, when you mentioned the complexity gap. Um, those multiple contributing driving um, factors which are active, uh, which are involved in this um, particular um, uh, um, disease. Uh, in general, health as we understand it or as we ought to understand it today is something extremely complex and we can struggle and we can observe to find all those factors, but we will probably never be able to um, to prove it in a uh, binary way, which was or used to be the standard in medicine um, uh, in the past. I, I would say so. Um, yeah. This this complexity gap, this this dichotomy of of evidence um, in health, is something which is about to shift? Am I right in this observation? Yes. And, and as you know, what's happened is that historically we looked at diseases that were simple and acute. So pneumococcal pneumonia, TB, things like that, and treated these rather simply. Now what's happened, of course, is the, the great uh, success of 20th century medicine was to use the combination 
uh, of uh, antibiotics and public health measures to decrease the number of people who would die from infectious illnesses. And unfortunately, we try to use that same strategy, get a single drug or a, or a very simple combination for complex illnesses like cancer and like Alzheimer's and like, uh, and like cardiovascular disease. And these are fundamentally different illnesses. They are complex, chronic illnesses. And therefore, the strategy must be different. Again, it's a little bit like using your checker strategy in a chess match. You have to change the strategy. And it starts with looking at all of the different contributors. Most people will have multiple. And as you know, uh, we've failed largely in Western medicine at dealing with complex chronic illnesses. And as we talked about earlier, neurodegeneration is probably the best example. We just haven't had anything that really works effectively against this. And it's because we haven't understood what's actually driving the problem. When we expand our data sets, when we look more at what are the actual drivers, then we can start making a big impact both on prevention and reversal. And you mentioned uh, early reversal, certainly easier, but we interestingly have seen some patients uh, recently who are very far along who still improve. Now, they didn't improve all the way back to normal, but functionally, as an example, going from not able to speak or dress yourself to being able to speak, interact with people and dress yourself, uh, you're not back to normal, but it makes a huge difference in your life. Absolutely, this is this is evident uh, um, even to a layperson such as I am, and and so if I get it right, um, the really um, novel information from your work is that not only Alzheimer is um, reversible um, with the right approach, with the right um, uh, understanding of what's going on, but it is also uh, preventable. Um, uh, in a very uh, reliable way. Um, so, in, in, a, in a talk I, I heard from you, you said Alzheimer's should be a rare disease, um, and this can only happen when we take precautions um, to um, to not uh, let those risk factors uh, take um, attraction. What what are the factors we should uh, watch out for? You, you I mean, you, you, you've termed it the recode uh, protocol. Right. Yeah, recode for reversal of cognitive decline. So you're absolutely right. Alzheimer's disease should be a rare disease. It, it is largely a disease of our living, of our lifestyle, of the things that we're doing, of the mistakes and assumptions we've made in the last hundred years. So what we suggest is that everybody over the age of 45 should have a cognoscopy. And everybody understands that when you turn 50, you should have a colonoscopy. That's something we're all aware of. So the idea is if you're over 45, get a cognoscopy. It's actually easier than a colonoscopy. Um, and all you do, you get a series of blood tests. And I go through all of these in the book, of course. Um, why? Because you want to know what are the things that are giving you risk for cognitive decline. And you want to address those so that you never have cognitive decline. The second thing is a simple functional test, and you can do this online in 20 minutes or so. Uh, you can do things like a MOCA test that are free and take about 10 or 12 minutes, or you can do an online test. And they give you a baseline and say, okay, how are you doing now? Because a lot of people, as you know, will be functioning suboptimally and will just kind of put it off, put it off, put it off until they're really much farther along. So you want to see it coming. Then if, you're, if you are asymptomatic, you don't need to do the imaging part. If you're symptomatic, you want to have an, typically an MRI with volumetrics. So you want to know your hippocampal volume, how that compares to others of your age. And then, of course, you want to, in the blood tests, um, include some basic genomics, which you can do, again, very inexpensively. You want to know if you are at risk. And as a simple example, the most important genetic risk factor in Alzheimer's is ApoE4. It is a uh, one allele of a protein that carries fats. And so most of us are ApoE3.3. That's the most common one. You can be a 2, 3, or 4. And of course, you have one copy from your mother, one copy from your father. 
And so if you have zero copies of ApoE4, your risk over your lifetime about 9% or so. If you have a single copy, it's about 30%. And if you have two copies, it's well over 50%. So most likely during your lifetime, you will get Alzheimer's disease. So it's good. In the past, people have said, well, you don't want to know because there's nothing you can do. And that's absolutely wrong. In fact, there's a wonderful website called apoe4.info. There are over 3,000 people now who are all positive, who are all sharing information. They're all on the program virtually on some uh, modification of the program or some variation of it um, and in the attempt to prevent and actually doing quite a good job. So uh, that's a, a good thing for people. Get make, make it so that your risk factors are minimal. And again, this is not something that would be at, at all surprising to the cardiovascular community. You know, they've been doing this for for several decades. It's just that there hasn't been a way in the past to do this for cognitive decline. Um, and now very, very successful ways to do this for cognitive decline. Right. Um, to, 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 to give a bit of um, um, history um, into this talk, um, you mentioned APOE4. And uh, if I get it right uh, from what you write in your book, um, this genetic component, so we have the lifestyle contributors, which we can basically control. We have the genetic components which we are born with and we have to cope with. But the very fact that this genetic expression does exist at all, and so the very fact that Alzheimer's is around at all, is something which without we wouldn't probably have not evolved as humans. I'm referring to this this uh, inflammatory, pro-inflammatory um, 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 uh, um, specification which this gene expression brought about in the first place. So maybe you want to um, uh, give some yeah. background on that. It's a good point. And this is uh, actually suggested originally by Professor Tuck Finch, uh, who is at USC, uh, pointing out that, you know, what did it take for us as hominids to come down out of the trees? It actually, if you look at the genes, um, that are that are altered between uh, chimps and humans. There actually aren't many. Uh, and in fact, you know, when I told my, my wife, I said, you know, my DNA is actually overall more similar to a, a male chimp DNA than it is to yours. And she said, well, duh, you know, it's obvious. Uh, so both coming up. <laughs> exactly. So, there, you know, there aren't that many differences. And as you indicated, a lot of them turn out to be pro-inflammatory. And chief among those ApoE4, and that was the primordial ApoE for the hominids. And so what did it take? As, as Professor Finch showed, you come down out of the trees, you're stepping on dung, you're fighting with your brethren, you're eating raw meat. For all of these things, you survive better with a more pro-inflammatory state. So that was great for our evolution. But it gets back to what you had said earlier. What do we actually want to do to make sure we do, don't get this illness? Well, if you just go back to the subtypes, it's very clear. Nothing that induces chronic inflammation. So check to make sure, what, check your HSCRP. It's an easy thing to do. It'll tell you if you have systemic inflammation. Check and see uh, whether, you have, you know, whether you have Lyme disease or, or mycotoxins or things that, that are potentially chronic inflammatory conditions. Probably chief among those, check to see if you have a leaky gut because this is actually quite important in a common way. So if you have metabolic syndrome, you're gonna have a high HSCRP, systemic inflammation, and an increased risk for Alzheimer's. Then check your trophic support. What are your hormones looking like? What are your, about your estradiol and your pregnenolone and your thyroid hormone and vitamin D, of course, we call it vitamin, but it's really a, a hormone like the others. All these things, testosterone, these are all helpful to know. And then what we call type 1.5, what is your fasting insulin? Mm -hmm. Insulin resistance is one of the most important contributors. You can absolutely deal with it and follow it metabolically and deal with it with respect to diet, exercise, stress, sleep. It's a relatively easy thing to deal with. There are also some simple things like berberine. So a pretty simple thing to deal with. And nobody should be walking around with insulin resistance because they are putting themselves at increased risk. And then for the, that's what we call type 1.5 because it's got both some inflammation mm -hmm. and some trophic loss. And then what we call type 3, 
um, that is the toxic one. So you, you want to know what is your status with respect to mercury? What is your status with respect to copper to zinc ratio, for, for example? Do you have exposure to specific biotoxins? So all of these things can help you to avoid and should allow the vast majority of people to prevent cognitive decline. And we're hearing every day, there are now over 2,000 people on the protocol, and we hear a new story every day from someone who's gone on and improved. So it's a very common thing. We're actually just writing up um, the next 50 cases of improvement and also starting a clinical trial. And you, you mentioned the trials earlier. No question, we have to reconsider the way we think about clinical trials. Instead of the old idea of single variable trials, these now must be multivariable trials reflecting the way diseases actually work. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, um, sadly, you have been turned down uh, with, uh, with uh, your protocol for such a proposal for a trial because it was deemed to be too complicated, right? So back in 2011, we actually tried to do the first comprehensive trial mm -hmm. for pre-Alzheimer's, uh, MCI as it's called, uh, and we tried to do this in Australia and we were turned down uh, because it was uh, too complicated and one of the things they said was, you know, you're trying to change more than one variable. And they said, obviously, you don't understand how to do a clinical trial because you're trying to change more than one variable. And we said, obviously, you guys don't understand Alzheimer's disease because it's not a one variable disease. We're now going back, however, to a different group uh, here in the States um, to do the same trial. So hopefully uh, things will come through. But again, it will require a reconsideration of the typical clinical trial. Yes, uh, and um, from a layperson's um, point of view, you can only wonder why this has taken so long for uh, for authorities and, and the science community to understand because it is striking that um, risk factors which you clearly identify um, come up at various um, issues, at various health issues, at various um, uh, diseases. So uh, um, you mentioned a leaky gut. I've just been having uh, the fortune to, to do an interview with Dr. Stephen Gundry about, about the plant paradox uh, and, and the issue of lectins, which of course may uh, and, and, and do, um, according to him, contribute um, substantially to leaky gut and once something has gotten into your bloodstream then it is a matter of uh, uh, how long it takes for it to get into uh, um, into the brain isn't it that's yeah well of course there is a blood brain barrier as well but not only can you have a leaky gut you can have a leaky blood brain barrier as you know so yes th these things are all critical players and it is interesting and i talked several years ago as i mentioned in the book I talked to a, a, a high-ranking official who's tasked with ridding the world of Alzheimer's and tried to explain the pathophysiology to him. And his response was, well, if you can get it down to three players instead of 36, then I might be interested. And so, you know, this is just silliness to say, you know, try to change the disease. Um, this is speaking as a politician, not as a scientist or physician. The reality is we have to deal with the disease that we've been, that we've been dealt as opposed to trying to negotiate with the disease to be changed. So uh, I think that you know, as the data come in, as we can see that, yes, when you really address all these different things, you really get unprecedented improvements. Ultimately, we'll be able to, to spread this to, to many, many people. Yeah, I mean, uh, the analogy seems also very striking, um, completely different area, but look at climate um, uh, research and, and climate change. It is enormously complex, but the signs are so um, clear on, on the wall that there is something going on there which we um, are, are a factor in, and, and, and uh, so we, 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 should, uh, we should do something about it. We haven't been able to... Uh, to, to provide a certain kind of evidence uh, and proof in this way, but um, what what do you need for in order to to get going, both in climate and in, in, in with regards to to health? It's a very good point. Um, I think that the next step is we need to show in a blinded you know crossover sort of trial, I mean standard clinical trial. Even though we've seen this you know anecdotally in hundreds and even a few 
Q1000 now, as I mentioned earlier, and we're, as I say, we're publishing additional cases. We need to have a standard clinical trial. Difficult because it's already not standard in a multivariable instead of a single variable, but then show that. And then ultimately, um, as you know, politics and finances drive everything. And so when we can show that, in fact, you can actually reduce health care costs, and when we can show that you can actually make the drugs which don't work very well work better on the background of a personalized program, then I think there will be general interest in this. Let me just re repeat this because I think we did have a slight um, um, a weakness of, uh, of our line here. You said okay. when you do this, you will also improve the effectiveness and the efficacy of, of drugs uh, which have a, uh, a role in, um, in modern medicine, of course, and no one is denying this. Exactly. No, I think that in fact that new drug candidates should be tested on the background of a personalized program because their likelihood of success should increase. When you're, you know, we make the analogy of 36 holes in the roof. If you've got a roof that's leaking and it's got 36 holes in it, which is what's with Alzheimer's, you've got all these different mechanisms at work. Uh, a great drug, it can be a very, very good patch for one hole, but it doesn't patch the other holes. So you've got to patch the other ones to see the effect that you're getting with that new drug candidate. Yeah. Um, I have a very long list of questions uh, on, uh, here, um, jot it down. And of course, um, this issue is so complex, we cannot um, possibly deal with all of them. But I would like you to explain a little bit about this um, concept of um, Ketoflex 12.3, um, which is, as I understand, a very important part of what each individual can do to minimize their own risk for cognitive decline. Yes, that's a good point. So one of the big questions is, what is the optimal nutritional approach uh, because we know that nutrition is a, is a critical issue here. We know this, for example, because people who have metabolic syndrome are at markedly increased risk. People who have type 2 diabetes, so incredibly important and, and so incredibly common these days, uh, it actually have about a tripling of their risk for Alzheimer's disease. So it's very clear that this is important. And so what we want to do, we, we named this Ketoflex 12.3 for the following reasons. We want to drive people into mild ketosis. Repeatedly, people see improvements in cognition with mild ketosis. And when I say mild ketosis, we actually recommend that people get a ketone meter. They're inexpensive, easy to use. And you want to drive yourself to between 0.5 and 4 millimolar beta-hydroxybutyrate, you know, which is one of the, uh, one of the ketone bodies. Um, so that's the keto part. Flex, because... Um, some people like to be vegetarians. That's absolutely fine. Some people like to have some meat or fish or both. Um, that's fine as well. It is a flexitarian. What we'd like to suggest, though, is that meat or fish represent, uh, these are essentially like condiments. So they're a small part of the overall diet. The major part of the diet should be vegetables of different types, colors, uh, organic. You don't want the, the toxins, etc. Um, but you want to, again, drive yourself. So this is not your typical um, ketosis type or ketogenic diet where you're eating a lot of bacon. You, the point here is to focus more on vegetables, good fats, avocados, nuts, seeds. By the way, this is very similar to what Stephen Gundry recommends uh, in his book, The Plant Paradox. Very similar to what Dr. Joseph Pizzorno uh, recommends in his book, which is called The Toxin Solution. You want to have a lot of fiber, soluble and insoluble. You want to continue, uh, because all of us are exposed to many, many toxins, you want to continue that detox. So it's ketotic, mild, it's flexitarian. If you're going to have some meat, make sure that it is, uh, you know, that it is pastured uh, chicken, make sure that it is grass-fed beef if you're gonna use that, and of course, wild-caught fish. And you want to use the smashed fish, you know, the salmon, mackerel, anchovies, uh, sardines and herring, um, not the large uh, tuna, swordfish, and shark that give you lots of mercury. Um, then 12-3 refers to the fasting periods. So you want a 12-hour fast between finishing your food in the evening and starting your food in the morning. And if you're ApoE4 positive, you want to bring that out to 14 to 16 hours. 
12 hours if you're ApoE4 negative. And that's simply because if you're ApoE4 positive, you actually absorb fat better. And so you actually are designed to go longer between meals. If you go out on the in the desert and someone dies from starvation, the ApoE4 people are going to outlive the ApoE4 negative people. Uh, so, uh, so that so that's the, the 12, and then the three refers to before bed. You want at least three hours uh, without eating because you don't want your insulin high when you go to bed at night. So that's the the idea of Keto Flex 12.3, and actually we're coming out with a follow-up book to go into more details of this. We also have a website um, that goes into the details um, of the Keto Flex 12.3 approach. Wow, wow. Um, one more question, if you allow. Um, one, one book which has been um, also very, uh, very revealing uh, to me in the understanding and and um, and dealing with uh, a serious um, uh, um, civilization uh, illness um, is is the book after cancer care from from dr dwight mckee um, he talks about um he, he lays down a, a protocol um, um, a, a recommendation of how cancer patients post treatment should um, be aware of certain things. And he talks about the trials of exercise, sleep rest, um, uh, and also um, of nutrition. So stress management, exercise, and nutrition. And this, this is basically a, a, a recurrent um, issue in your book as well. Is this a coincidence? Well, so, you know, it's a great point. And, and of course, uh, um, as you know, Walter Longo has, uh, has also uh, published on this area. Um, and has this so-called fasting mimicking diet, uh, and yet and this is you're you're tweaking a part of the essentially the epigenetics. You're changing the biochemistry in a way that is anti-Alzheimer's, and yes, it is also anti-cancer. Uh, and by the way, it's also anti-cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. Mm -hmm. So again, it gets back to the point that these diseases have a significant component from the poor choices we have made as a society in terms of eating, yeah. sleeping, stress, uh, uh, exercise, and all these things have contributed. Processed food, yeah. food, pesticides, these things have all, in the long run, given us chronic problems. And so, yes, the way to attack them has a lot of overlap. You're absolutely right about that. To close, maybe... So, uh, Ube, I, I lost you for a minute in the transmission. It looks like the uh, Skype did not work for a couple of seconds. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry, yes. Um, the question is, uh, the issue of, of supplementation, so um, of, of supplementing your diet, uh, our modern diet, which is a diet high in processed um, foods, um, so supplement this with, um, uh, with micronutrients is controversial in the community uh, of science and medicine. Uh, I would like to, to hear your point on, on, on this, on your point of view. Yeah, so let, let's take a step back for a moment. All of these diseases can be defined by three parameters, insults, response, and genetic background. So you're looking at for each of these, the insults, the response, okay. So to deal with those insults and the body's response to them for your given genetic background, You've already touched on the first part, diet, exercise, sleep, stress. These are all absolutely crucial, and we know how to optimize them for these illnesses. Then, in the case of cognitive decline, brain training, neuroplasticity, you can take advantage of the plasticity of the brain, as Professor Bersnick has shown over the years. Then, specific hormones that actually that support the brain. And then, as you said, specific supplements. And these are some nutrients, things like pyridoxal 5-phosphate, things like uh, methyl B12, as an example. You want to look at homocysteine, one of the risk factors for cognitive decline. You want to bring that down. Beautiful studies out of the UK showing the problems as the homocysteine goes higher and higher and how to deal with that and change the rapidity with which you undergo uh, undergo atrophy with age. 
Um, and then it includes specific herbs. And as you know, these various herbs have been used for thousands of years, which actually enhances the removal of the Bacopa monieri, rhodiola, uh, on and on, uh, Hericium arenaceus is another one, which leads to an increase in nerve growth factor. So all of these things used, again, appropriately on a personalized level based on your biochemistry and genetics. Again, you're looking at the insults, the response, and the genetics. You can now address these, and you, of course, supplements turn out to be very helpful. Uh, again, you have to get the right ones. You have to do the right things for your own biochemistry. One of the big problems we've had, at least in American medicine, is talking about what we call WNL, within normal limits. Mm -hmm. So you can have a homocysteine of 12, which is actually horrible, but it's within two standard deviations of the mean, so it's called normal. You can have a, a vitamin B12 of 300, which is horrible, but it's within two standard deviations, so it's called within normal limits. So I always talk to you like a competitive athlete. You don't want to have something that's at the low end of normal. You want to have the optimal range. And that's not about statistics. It's about physiology. And, and that's basically um, the, the approach of functional medicine, isn't it? I mean, um, yeah. Yes. And, you know, I would say that what we're talking about is really a precision medicine type of approach. Yeah. And of course, you know, functional medicine, integrative medicine, precision medicine, to some extent, they're all after the same thing, to address the root cause by defining the root cause and then looking at all the different factors and addressing all of those as clean as possible. Yes. Um, Dr. Bredesen, I, I'd like to continue this talk um, uh, um, beyond um, uh, your means and uh, Skype is also sending signals of, of uh, a weaker uh, line. So may I just close this talk? Um, thank you very, very much for this fascinating insight into your work, um, into the uh, complexity of, uh, of health, but also into the possibility uh, of what we can do to maintain um, a good health, a good cognitive health, um, which is um, very, very, very important because we are I mean, this is uh, something which uh, which separates us from uh, from from other um, animals. Um, our our mind, our our ability to 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 make reason and to think, and and um, so we have uh, we want to keep this up. And and you are doing an enormously groundbreaking work in this. Your book um, in English is called The End of Alzheimer's. In Germany, it will be called The Alzheimer Revolution. Um, the Revolution, uh, Alzheimer Revolution. It will be out in May in, in German. Uh, we are looking forward to it um, very, very much. And uh, thanks again for this uh, fascinating talk, Dr. Bresen. Thanks. Let's all work together to reduce the global burden of dementia. All the best to you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you.